Merry Christmas, Essential Church! We are so happy that you're here with us tonight. We're going to have a lot of fun. So stay alert. Be ready. Be ready. You guys ready to sing a song? All right, that side is. How about this side? You guys ready to sing a song over here? All right, well, first, we need you to be part of the band. We're going to ask you to clap, and I need you to clap on B. Oh, I can't do that? Okay. All right. Check the tempo. Welcome to the Christmas Eve service at Essential. We're glad you're here. Uh, it has been a wonderful and fabulous year. I'm going to do a couple of quick announcements uh, because we won't have service on Sunday. There will be a, uh, this service will be online uh, at 2 and 4 Christmas Eve. And then after that, it'll be available if you want to watch it again. Uh, but there will be uh, no service on Sunday. There will be one service on New Year's Day at 10.15. It will also be broadcast live, so uh, try to give everybody opportunity to spend time with family. And uh, she's not paying no attention. Uh, Get away with she that. don't know I got another one. Uh, but uh, 
you know, every week we get up here and we tell you or we say something to the effect of, you know, we invite you to give back a portion of what God richly blesses you with so we can continue the ministry right here at Virginia Beach as well as around the world. And on Christmas Eve services, we give the opportunity uh, to see some of the things that you've done throughout the year that you probably don't even know about. We can't show you everything because it would take too long, and Pastor Steve tell, cuts us a, a little, little video. Uh, but, uh, and then we can't even show you all of the people for safety reasons uh, that you've uh, helped this year. Uh, we, uh, we as a church, we as a body, uh, have brought people from Ukraine. Um, you have uh, provided money uh, to those uh, from other war-torn uh, countries, uh, Afghanistan, that have escaped. Um, as well as others. And it, although it doesn't sound like much, it means a tremendous amount to each and every one of them. Um, you've provided projectors, uh, food. Um, there are still some angel tree tags uh, for our uh, church in Nicaragua. Um, last year, you provided um, concrete, flooring, different things for a kitchen down uh, there for them to reach their community. Uh, this year, uh, we're collecting money to help them finish that building as well as uh, build a bread oven outside. Uh, they don't have any uh, AC or anything, so you can imagine the heat that's inside. So they're uh, building a bread oven so they can even reach more people in their community. Why? So that they might tell them about a loving relationship with Jesus they can enjoy for all eternity. You're a part of that. Uh, and so it's just an amazing uh, opportunity for you to see what God is doing through your generosity. And so we put a little video together, uh, invite you to watch that, and then uh, we'll continue some singing. Brothers and sisters from Essential Church, uh, today we are very excited, we are very happy, we are with the kids from the community, with Pastor Carminda and her supervisor, and we are so happy because today it is the opening of the building of the classroom you supported us to build, so we want to say thank you very much for supporting us, thank you very much for investing in the education of the kids, now the children will be in receiving their class in, a, in better condition with the new classroom, so thank you very much, may God bless you.
we uh, plan Christmas services back in the summer, and back in the summer, you know, we were co- still coming out of COVID, and it was a much smaller group, so we kind of planned this sort of intimate setting, and then as the church started to grow over the fall this year, and a lot of you all started coming back uh, to church, we kind of got panicked a little bit for this intimate setting we wanted to do, so we've kind of adjusted things a little bit to get more seats in here. But part of the inspiration was from back our very first Christmas as a church. We were meeting in a school, and we had a bunch of technical difficulties, and so the sound and worship team was like, don't let anybody in. It's a disaster in here, and it really was, and so it's almost part of the, the, the portable church kind of thing, and so we kept everybody out in the foyer, and we were running late, and so somebody from the worship team was like, well, I'll go keep them kind of entertained until we can get this set, and so just kind of went out there and prompted with a guitar and just started playing songs out in the foyer. And it was just kind of like one of those memories of like one of the best Christmas Eve services ever just because of that time. And so that was sort of what I wanted to recreate tonight. And I want to thank you guys for participating and then uh, singing along. I had a good time. Uh, this whole series that we've been talking about, Emmanuel, and it's been one of those things that uh, I've been trying to figure out exactly what is Emmanuel anyway. Uh, and it kind of reminds me at Christmas sometimes, you ever get those gifts at Christmas and you're opening it up and you're like, oh, this is, um, wow, it's, uh, uh, what is it, right? Like, like, like what it do, what it do, right? Um, so I kind of, wa- I had some of those t- this, uh, tonight. I wanted to see if maybe y'all could figure out, like, like if you were given this in your stocking, man, you guys know right what that is right there, right? <laughs> Do you have one of these? No. Would you like one of these? Here you go. Well, actually, now when I first pulled this out, Pastor Alex looked at that and he goes, oh, yes, I am. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> he looks at it and he goes, is that what the doctor uses to show you dilation? <laughs> there you go. It, it's to measure out how much you, uh, spaghetti to put, right? So you, you never know, right? I'm with that. You'll never know. Um, all right, let's see what else we got in our stocking here. What it do, what it do. All right, how about this? Multi-tool, bottle opener. There is a bottle opener on there, so I give you half credit. Nope, not a wire gauge. Oh, this is wonderful. This, uh, yeah, will come so in handy when I'm Ninja Star, no. When I'm, the closest one I had back here was, was what did you say? Bottle opener. Bottle opener and, no. Grill cleaner. Whatever kind of grill you find at the uh, barbecue, here you go. You, can you see? All right. <laughs> there you go. All right. We got one more in here. One more in here. Let's see. Oh, nope, that one. Not that one. Let's go with this one here. There we go. All right. All right. In this jar. It's a dash cleaner. That's a dash cleaner, yeah. Wow, you guys are right on it. I didn't even have to get this stuff out. You, do you have any of this? Now, now, if you're a kid, you'd say it's slime, but it's actually not slime. This is a tool. This is a sophisticated tool. <laughs> Hang on a sec. <laughs> See, I had this when I was a kid, but it made a better noise when you put it back in the can. <laughs> what it is, it's a dust cleaner. So you can put it on your keyboard, you can put it on your dash, and it will clean off the dust on your... Here you go. You. Where you go. We, we covered up what it was in case somebody could come up and see it. Um, but uh, in singing those songs, we just sang two songs. Does anybody have any idea what they even mean? Like, the first one was Noel. Anybody know what Noel even means? No. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's a song like you sing it every Christmas, kind of. It's one of the, and by the way, we sung a version that was based on the earlier version. Many of y'all know the first Noel, the angels did say. Uh, that actually dates back to the Renaissance period. Uh, Renaissance, the, the 14th, 15th century. Back then, they used to do these. Uh, it was really popular with the, uh, to do plays about biblical stories. And so they believe the song is traced back to a play with, that had music and song in it uh, in which they were talking about the birth of Jesus. And 
there is an old French word which either means good news or birth. It's, it's really funny. When people try to trace these things back, they can't even find back the old French it means. It either means good news or a birth. Uh, is actually what Noel, it has a root in old French of that. And then eventually it became so closely sino- or associated with Christmas and the singing of that song that in French, if you look up the French word for Christmas, it is just Noel. So if you were to wish somebody Merry Christmas in French, it would be, anybody know French? Joie what? Joie Noël. Joie Noël. Is that what Joie, is it Joie Ox? Joie Ox Noël? Yeah, Joie Ox Noël. Uh, yeah. How did you guys pronounce it though? It sounded so much better when you said it. What is it? Joie. Oh, Joie Noël. Uh, that's the thing. French is beautiful if you know how to pronounce it, but if you don't, wow, it's, it's real bad. Um, the other song, O Come Emmanuel, is actually much older than that. It actually goes back to the 8th and 9th century, uh, back when uh, they would chant. Uh, and, uh, there was like seven O songs. There was like O Adonai, um, O something about David, O Dayspring, and the last of them, of them was O Emmanuel. And what they would do is they would uh, chant or sing that song, and then they would read a passage from the Psalms or one of the songs about Christmas, uh, whether it be from Isaiah or the book of Psalms or even Mary's song that she sings. And the last of, there were seven of them, the last of them was O Emmanuel. And if you look at, they, they loved acrostics back then. Acrostics were the first letter spells out something, so O and then whatever the, it, it spells out, uh, let me make sure I get this one right. Um, it spells out, um, a Latin phrase, which means, I will be present tomorrow. And so sort of the crescendo of it would be singing, O Emmanuel, which means God's with us, and the acrostic is spelling out, I will be present tomorrow, this picture of Christmas that I will be present tomorrow. I will be here, I have been here, I will always be here. And so uh, the song is really just all about, I will be here. And it comes out of Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 to 23, where he says, this is the angel was talking to Joseph about Christmas. He says, But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save people from their sins. And all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So, As I was moving through just kind of studying this word, God with us, and thinking about it, um, the whole, I I started thinking, like, when do we talk about God with us? Um, You know where it comes up most with Christians? Where? Tragedy. Tragedy? We do talk about it some at tragedy. Uh, Most of the people, though, they say it without even thinking that they're saying it. It's in our prayers. Oh, Lord, just ask that you watch over us and be with us while we're traveling this Christmas. Oh, Lord, I just ask you to watch over and be with us as we're sitting here tonight and hearing this. Oh, Lord, I just ask you to watch over and be with us as I put up with this kid. You know, just, we just, it just rolls off our tongue. Oh, Lord, just watch over and be with us. And we, we say it like we don't even know what it means. It just sort of comes out. Uh, but the whole picture we've been sort of, sort of exploring here is, is that um, it means God with us. The, the, um, the bumper for the series, it's, 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 it's this, this clip I've been using from Charles Spurgeon. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was probably the first uh, modern megachurch pastor. He was over in England, had a church of five to 6,000 people back in the 1800s, which was, I mean, amazing back in that day. Uh, long before multimedia and everything else, he had this church of five, 6,000 people in, in England. And this was a sermon that he had preached about Emmanuel. I'm just going to replay it for you if we could. I just want you to listen to the beauty of the way he explains it. God with us is eternity's sonnet, is heaven's hallelujah, is the shout of the glorified, is the song of the redeemed, is the chorus of angels, and is the everlasting oratorio of the great orchestra of the sky. God with us, Emmanuel, it is wisdom's mystery, God with us. So Pastor Alex found that clip, and he's like, I think I got the perfect thing for, for, Christmas, uh, for the Christmas series bumper, and he plays it for me. I go, that's beautiful. I have no idea what it means, but that's beautiful. Yeah. And, and as I'm listening to it, I listened probably three, four times, and the only thing that came to mind was this clip from Shawshank Redemption. I have no idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about. 
I like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words and makes your heart ache because of it. I tell you those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a great place dares to dream. It was like some beautiful bird flapped into our drab little cage and made those walls dissolve away. And for the briefest of moments, every last man at Shawshank felt free. Honestly, that's actually probably the best description I can give you of Emmanuel when you really begin to understand it. Everything that Spurgeon was talking about is, it's this chorus that everything in heaven and earth is exploding with amazement and wonder at the fact that God has left the spiritual dimension and he's come down into the physical world that he created. I would say my hope every year at Christmas is at some point that hits you exactly what God has done, the absurdity of it, the amazement of it. Uh, Spurgeon just so much more eloquently says the everlasting oratorio of the or- great orchestra of the sky. Oratorio means like a, like a huge symphony, like Handel's Messiah would be an oratorio. Uh, it, it, is, it is the masterpiece of everything God has ever done from beginning to end to step out of eternity and, and the spiritual dimension and into our physical world. And so those songs that we would sing with lyrics, I don't even know if we even know what we were just singing. Things like Oh, come thou day spring, come. Oh, man, it keeps on disappearing. I, sometimes I don't like the internet. Oh, come thou day spring. You got that one? Oh, come thou day spring, come and cheer. Our spirits by thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight. I mean, that's beautiful, right? I don't have any clue what it, really, what it all means, but it's beautiful, right? But it's just trying to describe this, this moment where God steps out of eternity and steps into our world. And so uh, next song that our worship team is going to be singing is just a song that maybe puts it more in plain terms about God stepping out of eternity and stepping into our time. I just want you to listen to the words uh, as they're being sung and really begin to think and concentrate on what it truly means for God to come and become with one of us. Thank you. 
So there's some gifts you open up, and you first thing you ask is what it do. There's other gifts you open up. Maybe once you realize what it does, you're like, oh my gosh, that's the perfect thing. Like some of you like right now are wanting to go out and get that little spaghetti thing, so you know how much spaghetti to cook. Uh, I just cooked spaghetti this past, this past week for my kids, and I was wondering the same thing, especially with teenage boys. I don't know if that thing's accurate for teenage boys. I, I don't know if it's quite the same size. Maybe I need to add something to it. But there's other gifts that are just the perfect gift. Like somebody has to really know you really well to get the perfect gift. You know what I'm talking about? Some people are impossible to get for. Some people, like you see that thing, you're like... This is it. This is the perfect gift. So uh, I need four volunteers to come up and open what might be the perfect gift. Anybody? You already got something, so not you. Anybody? Somebody has already got something. I need four people to come up, open the perfect gift. It's the perfect gift. Who doesn't want to get the perfect gift? Come on up. All right, come on. Just come on. I don't don't need to see your hand. I can't see anybody's hand. Uh, I need adults, though. I got to have adults. Sorry. 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 No kids. Got to have adults. Sorry. Um, All right, here we go. Just, you got to come forward. I cannot, I literally cannot see anybody beyond about the second row because the lights, see what I'm talking about? See, you guys can't see anything, can you? All right, here we go. All right, perfect, 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 perfect. All right. Let's just, oh, uh, wait, we got too many. Uh, oh, sorry, we got, okay. Here you go. Uh, here you go. Here you go. Here you go. I honestly don't know who got what here. So, um, all right, now what you have to do when you open the gift um, you have to say this script as you're opening it. All right, you need to open a gift and say, oh, it's, and then you got to tell, tell, see, they won't be able to see what you're a guy. Can I borrow a microphone real quick? All right, so I'll hold this for you while I do it. So you, you open it up and you go, oh, it's, and then you say what the product name is. This stuff is the best for, and then you got to say what it does, okay? This will really come in handy for my, repeat what it does. And then you say, thank you, you must really know me and know that I needed some, whatever the product does, okay? (laughs) All right, so you can turn around so you can face everybody. So let's see what you got. It's a box. All right. (laughs) Oh, wait. Oh, it's TheraBreathe. It's the best stuff for your nose. Nope, nope, read again. <laughs> oh, for your breath. Fresh breath. You got stanky breath. Yeah, mm-hmm. This, this will one. really come in handy for uh, my tender dates. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You must really know I needed some fresh breath. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, yep. Oh, I can't open it. Uh, go to the other side. There you go. Okay. Re- re- release. <laughs> Odor right. X. Okay, okay. Right, right. Oh, it's. Oh, it's Odor X Ultra Odor Fighting Foot Spray Powder. <laughs> this is best. This is best stuff for smelly feet. This will really come in handy for C- Chris after he goes to the no, gym. No, no, <laughs> my, my, for my, for my, for my husband after he comes home from the gym. <laughs> Thank you. You must really know me. Thank you. You must really know me. I needed some foot powder spray. All right. Thank you so much. Give her a round of applause. All right. You're probably thinking, what on earth has he got next, right? Yeah. It is the perfect gift, I think. Let's see what it is. <laughs> By the way, these were handed out at random. I just pulled them out, so... Oh my, it's it's like any monkey butt. (laughs) This is the best stuff for, I guess, the itchy butt. (laughs) This will really come in handy for my dog's butt. (laughs) Thank you, you know me so well. You're welcome. (laughs) Give them all a round of applause. Thank you all. (laughs) You see... There are some gifts that when you get them, 
there's this realization that they're saying something about you when they give you the gift. You with me on this? Like, you, you, you've probably given, been given some of those gifts. I know those were really mean, rude, embarrassing. I'm sorry for that. Uh, they, let, I, I let you all come up here on your own. I was not calling anybody up. That's why I let you. And by the way, don't you dare tell anybody what's going on. That's one of our rules Christmas Eve. You can't tell anybody what's going to happen at the service before they come. You, you just got to tell them to come. You can invite them. You just can't tell them what's going to happen, all right? Um, but there are some gifts you get that when you open it and you realize that somebody thought of you and thought, you need a Dr. Now sticker. You need that on your refrigerator that says you're not going to starve. I think I actually need that on my refrigerator sometimes. Uh, actually, I do. I have a real problem with this kind of thing. Uh, or whether it be monkey butt or uh, the stinky foot spray or the bad breast spray. They're basically saying something about you that you need to take care of. Now, what, by the way, what's funny about this is... is um, before COVID hit, we actually were, had this whole promotion uh, ready for Easter, because we usually do some sort of like way for you to help you invite people to Easter, and there was, with the promotion that never was, because COVID hit, and then we didn't ever use it, but we had already ordered it, because you got to order stuff ahead of time, and so maybe it's a good thing we never actually used this, but <laughs> um, we have cases of gum uh, essential gum. Actually, we actually had essential gum, some green gum. And the idea was that you were to give it to a friend, and it says, God breathed life into humanity, but yours smells like death. <laughs> so, you need this. And then it says in small print, it's up to you to figure out whether I'm talking about the gum or the church invite. You see, like, never mind, I'll, I'll let you figure it out anyways. But the problem is, by the time COVID ended, the gum was expired, so we couldn't use it. But several people on staff have already used it, though, to see if it's still good. It's a little crunchy, but once you kind of get some flavor into it, or once you start chewing it, it actually works. At your own risk, if you want some on your way out today, you're welcome to take some with you. Even if you put in other gum and give it to somebody this Christmas, I don't care. Um, do with it what you will, but if you... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But if you chew it, you're doing it at your own risk. If I said that very clearly, it is expired. It is at your own risk. And you're taking it for novelty purposes not to be consumed at your own risk. All right, so anyways, uh, that's, that's outside. Oh, one other last story I got to tell about the monkey butt thing. Uh, do you know how embarrassing it is, though, to go buy these things? <laughs> so... <laughs> No, it's different places. I, I try to get stuff on Amazon when I can. The monkey butt was going to take too long to get here. So Pastor Chris is like, oh, no problem. I think they, I, uh, he looked it up online and saw they sell it. Where do you think you'd find monkey butt? Close, close on the Ace Hardware because somebody's probably shopped for it. Um, tractor Supply, that is correct. Tractor Supply, where everybody would go to get it, right? So... So Chris is like, oh, there's one up on the peninsula. Kelly's up there right now. I'll send her. <laughs> so Pastor Chris sends his wife to go get some. And she, you, know, she, she, you don't have time to explain it. You know, the whole, well, this is all for Chris. You guys don't even know why I've done this yet. Um, Kelly didn't even know why we were doing this yet. So she goes in and she asks. They have to get the manager. He doesn't know. But the, as she's leaving, he goes, well, I hope you find something to help you with your problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, I ended up having to go to the store here in Red Mill to find some, and yes, it was very awkward to walk, because where on the earth would you find this in Tractor Supply? They don't have like a, a pharmacy section at Tractor Supply, right? So I've got to go ask these two young 20-somethings if they know where Monkey Butt is, and they're looking at me like, we sell that? <laughs> um, and then I've got you know, handfuls of it as I'm walking up to the cash register. Uh, I said, it's for ladies. You know, clearly, it's not for me. It's actually Lady Monkey Butt. Um, <laughs> So why? why? Why all of that? Well, there's something we sort of skimmed over when I read that passage out of Matthew, which talks about Christmas. In Matthew, when he talks about the, the Christmas story, he says, and you were to give him the name Jesus. You were to give him the name Jesus because he will save people from their sins. See, at the heart of Christmas, and the reason why we give gifts, the reason why we're out there trying to find the perfect gift for somebody, is it's all a reflection of the fact that God gave us the perfect gift at Christmas, which was Jesus. 
But the thing about a gift is to say it's the perfect gift and it's just what I needed. Oh, Jesus, that's just what I needed. To say that Jesus is the perfect gift is also an admonition that your life is full of sin. And to be honest, in church we won't mind talking about sin, but if we're anywhere else, we don't like talking about ourselves and our own sin. We, we make mistakes, we messed up, I, I wasn't thinking clearly. We, we use every other word we want to, but to really get down to it, to say that I need a Savior and I truly need Jesus, and to say really that God has given us the perfect gift is also an admonition to say something I don't want to admit or confess, and that is that I am a sinner and I am desperately in need of Jesus to come in and save me. So that's why you have monkey butt. Um, which is why at Christmas, it's hard to keep holidays apart from other holidays, right? Like, oh, we always have these things with, you know, when is the, when is the store going to start putting out Christmas stuff? Uh, can you start playing Christmas music before Thanksgiving? Is, is Christmas taking over Thanksgiving? Uh, but honestly, when you think about it, the real question at Christmas is, is Easter overshadowing Christmas? Can you really keep Christmas and Easter apart? Can you really separate out the two holidays? Or if you look at the, Christmas, the, the words of Christmas songs, you'll find it's almost impossible to take Easter out of Christmas. You almost can't take that holiday away from this one. It just seems to always creep in. And so as we were looking through different songs that talked about Emmanuel and God being with us, uh, you'll notice in this next song that we're going to be singing the the message of Easter is all over this song. Because to truly understand that Christmas is the perfect gift for us, we have to recognize that the ultimate gift of Christmas came to its fruition at Easter. Uh, so with, the, with us, who you, uh, we put the words up on the screen, by the way. Uh, you can sing along if you want, but really it's just so you can focus in on the words of the song, uh, that they might hit you in a, in a way that wouldn't otherwise if you were just listening to these things that casually on the radio.
So was that an Easter song or was that a Christmas song? I mean, if you look at the, the words of it about um, the heavens war, the earth stood still, his final breath, he tore the veil, the angels sang his holy name, he defeated death, he broke the grave, our hope returned, the lost are saved, we lift our voice in ever-ending praise. I mean, really, other than the line Emmanuel, everything about, else about that song really is an Easter song when you think about it. Uh, the whole thing is all talking about what Jesus Christ ultimately did on the cross. And, and so at Christmas, it's impossible to not allow Easter sort of to creep in on the story. So what is it about Emmanuel, God with us forever, that is so special? Uh, what is its tie with Easter, and what does that really mean to us? And, and to really understand this, I, I kind of have to give you a little bit of understanding about the Old Testament. Uh, and the reason is because... You all live in New Testament era. I mean, every, I mean, we've all been alive since, I mean, you know, the New Testament has been around for thousands of years before we came along. And in the same way that it's, it's you can look at the video up there of the children walking into a feeding center. Now, by the way, you all did that. That, that building that's there, you all did that. That was just a dirt floor with a, a shack of a sides, and you all came in and basically concreted that floor and fixed that place up so they would have a schoolhouse and a place to eat. Uh, and this year, like what Pastor Chris was talking about, you're going to be putting the kitchen on the back so that way the heat of the, of the kitchen doesn't just make that whole place one big oven. Your kids will never know what it's like to have a bowl that they carry with them to school so that they can get their one meal a day. Your kids will never know that, right? And when your kids say, oh, come on, I'm starving, you, I mean, you can look at them and say, you will never know what it means to actually starve, right? Isn't that fair? Your kids will never know what that really means. You just can't have any concept of it. And you, and you at least can maybe take them to go visit a, a, a place like Nicaragua, and maybe they could see and experience it from, from a, a distance, but they still don't know what it's like, okay? And when we say we feed those children every day, they're getting one full meal. They're not getting the full three courses. They get one full meal a day, uh, and it's enough to sustain them. In the same way that you don't know what it's like to live with that reality, you also don't know what it's like to have lived in the Old Testament days and time. And and the reason I say that is because you live in this era of God with us, of God in us. But back in the Old Testament, it wasn't always so. If you go back and read the story of Samson, Samson was one of the leaders of Israel uh, back in the book of Judges. Uh, Samson was sort of like the Hercules of the Hebrew story. Uh, and He had great strength. Uh, but he had great strength. It was a gift that God had given him. And in, in part, it was connected to the fact that he had made what was called a Nazarite vow. And when you made a Nazarite vow, there were three things that you were vowing to never do. Uh, one of them was that you would never drink wine or anything that came from the vine of the grape. And a uh, second one was that you would never become ceremonially unclean uh, by doing things like touching something that was dead. Uh, and then the third thing was that you would never cut your hair. And so that was what it meant to take a Nazarite vow. Well, if you read through the story of Samson, he breaks every one of them. Uh, he breaks the first one, he, has a, he ends up marrying uh, a woman uh, that doesn't share his faith, and that was also a big no-no, but it wasn't a part of his vow, but so whatever. Uh, but at the wedding, he does this drunken feast for about a whole week long. So I'm not talking just took a sip of wine, I'm talking was drinking to the point where he got hammered all week long. Uh, and then later on, he ends up seeing a lion on the side of the road, and he goes over and he tears that thing apart uh, and does some stuff with that. He also you know, uses a bone as a, as a weapon in war, and so he doesn't care anything about that vow either. And then if you know the story, he eventually meets this girl named Delilah, who's no good for him, and she desperately wants him to be captured and sort of you know, basically get a payoff for it. And so he starts toying with the idea of maybe uh, telling her about his vows and where his strength lies and the fact that 
Uh, he only has the strength because God's given it to him. And so first he says, well, if you were to bind me with cords, and then that was out of a lie. This is, well, if you were to braid my hair, and he's getting close to it. And eventually he tells us, well, if you cut my hair, well, then that would you know, be the, the final straw between me and God. And sure enough, she does just that. Well, every single time that uh, Samson had sort of toyed with this, you know, when, when he drank the wine and got drunk, God didn't do anything. He kind of let him slide, gave him some grace there. When he touched the dead animal, God gave him grace and let him slide there. But when he finally cut his hair, God said, that's it, that's enough. And there's this very disturbing and scary moment that you read in the story. It says, when Samson awoke from his sleep, he thought, uh, now by the way, people are coming to attack him. And, he's, and every single time that people come to attack him, he's able to fight him up because of his great strength. And it says, he woke from his sleep and he thought, I'll go out bef- just as I have before and I'll shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. That's a scary moment. Later on, as you read through the scriptures, in the next book of the Bible is, is 1 Samuel. Uh, in the book of 1 Samuel, they finally anoint a king to be over Israel. His name is Saul. Uh, well, Saul, just like Samson, a lot of the other leaders, he does a lot of things he shouldn't be doing again and again and again. And God gives him grace, God gives him grace, God gives him grace. And then eventually he finally pushes it too far. And Samson, or Samuel, the prophet, comes to him and says, that's it. God's removing the kingdom from you, and he's moving on. And that's when God ultimately anoints David to become the next king. And it says in there, right after this happens, in 1 Samuel 16, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit came and tormented him. And he ends up having a lot of headaches because of this. Uh, and then it says in there that, uh, actually this was the opening for when David actually kind of came into the king's court. Uh, David was really good at playing the ancient guitar. And so he would ask for David to come in and play guitar to kind of soothe his headaches. And that's how David ends up in the king's court to begin with, is right there because of this moment. But just follow me now here. So Samson has this amazing strength, and he loses it because of his sin, and God's spirit leaves him. Saul, he has the ability to be the king over the people, and he continues to mess up and sin, and the Lord leaves him. David, if you know anything about David's story, David makes some mistakes as well. Probably bigger mistakes even than Saul made. Uh, he has an affair. He has the guy's, or has the gal's wife, uh, sorry, has the, the gal's husband murdered uh, to kind of complete everything so he can do what he wants to do. And a year goes by, nothing happens, but the prophet is now Nathan. So it was Samson, and, or, Sam, or Samuel, now the prophet Nathan, comes to him and calls him out on his sin. And David is freaking out. And if you read Psalm 51, I want to read you David's prayer. He starts off, to me, starts off and he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgression. Wash away my sin. Cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew in me a steadfast spirit. And now listen to this next line. And do not cast me from your presence or take your spirit from me. What's what's David terrified of? He's terrified that just like Samson and just like Saul, just like Saul, God's going to take his spirit away and leave him in that same state that those other guys were. That was his fear. Now here's the thing. We don't understand this because this doesn't happen anymore. You see, after Jesus came, God makes this promise, I will never leave you. I never will. I never will. When Jesus was here among us, he promised his disciples, I am going to go away, but I'm going to send another of the promised Holy Spirit, which is the embodiment of me, which will be in you, and he will never leave. He is a deposit in you. When you begin a relationship with me, he will be deposited in you in the same way you would make a deposit, guaranteeing that you're going to come back to make good on the offer. The Holy Spirit will be God's spirit in you that will be a deposit guaranteeing that he will come back. That's why Jesus says, I'm going away, but I'm coming back because I'm leaving a deposit in you, which is the Holy Spirit. In other words, not even your sin, when you begin a relationship with God, would ever cause God to take his spirit from you. Now, on the one hand, now if you were in the Old Testament and you were to tell somebody like David that, that would blow their mind. Could not possibly comprehend that God would even do such a thing. And quite honestly, when we really figure it out, a lot of people want to then take advantage of it. Wait, you mean to say that No matter what I do, God ain't going nowhere. There'll be two attitudes of that. One is, well, then I might as well just continue on going down this bad path. Others would say, 
when God's made that kind of a commitment to me, there's no way in my right mind I would ever want to take advantage of that. It says in Hebrews chapter 13, it says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And that is what the true gift of Christmas is. It's a gift we just take for granted. It's a gift we don't even realize because we've been living in it for so long, everything in our life is completely immersed in it, we don't even realize how good we have it. It's like looking to your kids and saying, you know what you guys, you know what you guys got this year for Christmas? You got to live in America. Merry Christmas. And they'd be like, no, I want something. And that's why when we come to Christmas and I say, you've got God with us, Emmanuel, aren't you excited about that? No, I want something else. We have a hard time grasping and understanding it because it's been such an amazing gift that you live with all your life, you don't even recognize what you have. But to a kid in a third world country, to have anything like what you have, that would blow their mind. For somebody back in the Old Testament times to have God with us, to be living and walking among us, for Moses, when God's presence came by, it terrified him. Everybody in the Old Testament, it terrified them. And I know my very first message in this series was a little odd, okay? I know, I've already gotten some feedback on it. I know, it was a little odd. But I was trying to give you a picture of what it was like when something from a spiritual dimension steps into our physical reality and it freaks them out. See, we can't have any concept of it, but in the Old Testament, everybody time it happens, people freak out. And that's why the first thing out of the angel's mouth is always, don't be afraid. Why are they, why? Why, why would he say that? Because you freak out. Don't be afraid. God's coming. Now, anybody in the Old Testament hears that God's going to show up, they would run because they'd be terrified of God's presence. So how does God come? As a baby. Even Ricky Bobby likes that one. <laughs> right? But it came as a baby so that you wouldn't understand and know that God wants to be close. He didn't want you to be afraid. He wants you to realize this is a gift for you. But to truly receive this gift, you have to recognize how much you need this gift. You have to recognize I truly am a sinner and I'm in desperate need of a Savior. I need Jesus. I need God with me in my life. Now, as hard as it was to accept those other gifts earlier, for some of you, it may be really difficult to truly accept Jesus Christ because that would actually mean that you would have to say, I'm not in control of my life. There is a God who has say over my life I'm responsible and accountable for the things that I've done, and I desperately need to be forgiven for what it is that I've done. For some of you, that's a step you made long ago. For some of you, it's a step you've been resisting for a long time. And tonight, I just want to invite you to receive that gift, this gift of Christmas, to receive God, to receive His grace, to receive His forgiveness. that you might understand that once God, once you begin a relationship with God, he's with you for life. He will never leave you nor forsake you. There is no sin you could ever commit that would ever be so great that God would cast you out. David was terrified that would happen because back in the Old Testament times, that happened. I'm telling you right now, because of God with us, because Emmanuel, because of what Jesus Christ has done, that will never happen to you. He's made a promise. I'm going to ask, we're going to sing one more song and uh, in the middle of it we'll break and have some time for communion. The two elements of communion, by the way, is it's Jesus' sacrifice. That's what he came. He came to give us his life. But that cup is that promise that says, I will never leave you. This is a covenant. It is a cup of a covenant, a new covenant I'm making with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. My love for you will never end. My presence with you will never go away. And if you've never taken or received that, my invitation to you tonight is that you begin a relationship with God that you'll enjoy for all eternity by asking for forgiveness and entering into a loving relationship with him. Just spend some time to reflect and to think about that in your relationship with God and where you are uh, as we move into this time of worship. Step from your
your throne took on all flesh and made this world your home trembling in reverence lord we look above overcome by such Jesus, my Savior, I bow at your birth, awed by the mercy that brought you to earth, leaving the angels in glorious light for the deep shadows of Bethlehem. Oh 
Father, we do truly thank you for a gift, one that we can never repay. One more thank you almost doesn't seem enough. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.